All right, Coach. Thanks for joining me today on this simple Coach to Coach interview. Really do appreciate you taking the time. I know coordinating this was a little bit difficult because you're having a, a camp today, a, a little little rug rat camp. So um, I know that was difficult. Not to mention you're probably exhausted right now to talk to me. So, but I do appreciate you you making the effort today. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm looking forward to the discussion. And yeah, it's getting a little toasty here in University Heights. Uh, today we're in the uh, the 80s, and it's looking like a high of 96 tomorrow. So a lot of water breaks, a lot of shade, and got to get those kiddos <laughs> off the field as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, okay. So. <clears throat> I usually, I say usually, anyone I interview, I generally go to the to their online bookstore and I buy a cap because I, you know, like it's my commitment to this whole Division Three soccer thing. Like, you know, it's the least I can do for the program is to support it wearing a hat, and, you know, and I have some interesting ones. Trine University, who has a Trine University hat in New Jersey? Right. So I got some, you know, Colby Sawyer is another one. Um, But being a Mount Union grad that I am, I tried. I, I really, really tried. I was there, bookstore, hat chosen, probably three times, to the cart, got, and I just couldn't pull the trigger. So... I apologize in advance, but <laughs> I respect that. Okay, there so go. there we go. We're ready to roll. Um, <clears throat> all right. So you've been. I, I think I got this straight. You've been the the, the head coach at John Carroll since um, twenty twenty one is the official, right? right? I mean, you took over for a legendary guy. Um, uh, would it, realize it or not, know my history. I was a former Canton Invader and played against the Cleveland Crunch. And Hector Marinaro made me look silly as a goalkeeper. Um, and you, I, I, I get that you, you were his assistant for the longest of time. But, you know, maybe you could just talk about sort of how you got to where you're sitting right now and sort of the path that you, you followed and obviously learning from a guy who had a, you know, I think a really big positive impact on John Carroll soccer. Sure, yeah. Um, I got to John Carroll kind of by dumb luck, if I'm being honest. Uh, really young for my grade. I graduated high school when I was 17, graduated JC when I was 21, just how the calendar worked, and I kind of went to school early, so... Um, in the recruiting process, I was kind of at the point in my soccer career where I was very burnt out. I was playing for the International Soccer Club. I was playing multiple age groups at one time, tournaments every weekend, uh, European tours with the North American All-Stars every other summer. And once I hit that like, driving age of 16, I kind of wanted to do other stuff and um, get away from soccer. But I was lucky that I, I have I had mentors around me, and George McQueen Anshoff, which I'm sure you're familiar with from the Cleveland Force days. Who yeah, kind of straightened me out and we're like, listen, you know, you might not want to play at the highest level, but um, for you not to play in college would not be a good move for you and all that you, all the effort you put in and the path you've been on. So they, they, they luckily straightened me out. Um, and I kind of missed the whole recruiting process. I was getting the letters in the mail because internet really wasn't a thing back then or the emails, what have you. Uh, and I wasn't responding to coaches because I just, I didn't want to play. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar also with uh, another former Canton Invader, Ali Casamani, uh, who was. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was really good friends with my dad. Uh, my father played at Cleveland State with Kaz. And at the time, Kaz was the coach here, and George was close with uh, Kaz and, and my dad as well. So it kind of just uh, became an option um, at, here at JCU. And it just so happened that my best friend growing up, uh, TJ Kolba, who is now the assistant coach at Michigan State. Uh, he was here already for two years, and he was like, come on, man, like, let's go let's go do this. And um, I showed up uh, over here, had a great career. Um, but like I said, it, like I didn't do it the way I, I have my recruits do it. No, that's for sure. It was very backwards. It was based on soccer. It was based on friendships and coaches where it's literally the polar opposite of when I recruit kids and tell them what not to do. 
uh, because that's what I did. I just got lucky. <laughs> you made all the mistakes. <laughs> literally, literally. Um, and then after my last game, my senior year, uh, it was a Sunday in the round of 32 of the NCAA tournament. Um, I knew I didn't want to leave this place. It, 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 I knew it was over for me from a player standpoint. Uh, I had gotten into coaching already with the International Soccer Club, coaching the youth and um, being involved with George and Louie, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, so I, I requested a meeting with Cass, and I, I kind of made a comment like, hey, if you're looking for a volunteer or if I can hang around or whatever capacity, I would love to, to do that if you're interested in, in having me. And uh, anyone who knows Cass, he kind of gave me a, that grin and chuckled, and he goes, hey, man, there's some stuff going on right now. I'll get back to you in a couple of days. And I didn't really understand. I said, okay, I, I'm, you know, kind of used to that with Kaz. And sure enough, two days later, he left and took the Cleveland State job, uh, Division I, um, at his alma mater. He took yeah. TJ uh, Colba, who was the assistant my senior year with him, uh, to Cleveland State. And now this vacancy happened here at JCU. Uh, well, Hector Marinero walks in the door. And um, if I'm being totally honest, I, I know you played against them. But growing up, I mean, I was at the Convocation Center every Friday and Saturday night. I was wearing his jersey. I was at the, the game in 94 when he scored the game-winning goal and was running around the field. Like, I remember that like it was yesterday. He was a, a hero of mine growing up. And yeah. I, still, I still say he's like the LeBron James of indoor soccer. The guy's still a yeah. Yeah, totally. celebrity in Cleveland. And, and anywhere you go with him uh, in, a, in a soccer environment, everyone knows who he is. And yeah. um, John Carroll decided to hire Hector. Uh, Hector called Kaz and, and George Nanshoff and he's like, Hey, I need an assistant. And you know, who do I, who do I hire? They both said me and Hector listened to him and hired me and the rest is history. And then, you know, spending 15 years with someone in a coaching capacity inside a program, I think is just, it's unheard of now, not nowadays, you know, it's yeah. everyone's kind of bouncing from spot to spot. Um, Hector was extremely loyal to me. I was extremely loyal to him. Uh, I say it all the time. I literally consider him my best friend. Uh, he he's someone I tell my all my you know deepest and darkest secrets and ask for advice yeah. and um, like again mentorship and guidance and all that stuff. I consider him family. And those fifteen years together were something you know made storybook. It was just like a dream. You know, you yeah. you walk in every day and you can't believe that you're 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 coach you're coaching with Hector Mar Marinera. Literally, I would go to our. Um, secretary's office to pick up our, our mail and there's a ton of fan mail you know it's like literally people are <laughs> sending cards for him to autograph and posters and, and things like that so i would always joke that i was kind of like his agent or pr guy i would go <laughs> up, bring it to him he would sign it i i envelope it back up put it back in the mail but um he was a great coach uh a, a, a great player obviously but he's a way better human being than, than those two things and he was a fantastic player uh, but I can't say enough uh, enough ni nice things about Hector. He's uh, he's a huge reason w why I'm sitting in the seat today. Not only was he a great player, but he had a great soccer mind. I mean, there was a guy. If you watch the videos, and I gone back, you know, reminiscing. <clears throat> he um, in indoor especially, he had this uncanny ability to be in places where the ball was going to go and and he would sit in front of goal and you'd be like, Oh, that was easy. And then you try to replicate it. And it's just nearly impossible. Yeah, he's, he's uh, he, he talks about that all the time. Actually. He's a big hockey guy. He still plays hot. Well, until he moved to Florida here on when he retired a year ago, he was playing in a hockey league every week, a year round. And uh -huh. he's like growing up in Canada, you know, understanding the boards and, and the angles and things like that was huge yeah. for how he implemented that in indoor soccer. Oh, that's interesting. I never knew that. That that makes it that makes a ton of sense then, because like I said, and he he would play the boards like nobody else. Like it was he he totally expected the ball off a board in a way like everybody else would sort of be like panicky. Like no, he knew where it was coming to every time. And ironically, that goal I uh, referred to when they when they won their first championship with the crunch was a ball off the board that he one timed into the the top yeah. of the net to, to win the whole thing. Yeah. So, yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Um, uh, let me just ask, from when you're, I mean, since you've been at John Carroll for, I mean, it sounds like your career, right, your coaching career, is there a difference between the players you recruited 15 years ago or, and, or 17 years ago and the players 
you you see now? Like, are they are are they more talented today, or I mean, what? Are any differences between the players? Yeah. So I've been at John Carroll. I just finished my twentieth school year total. So four years oh. as a student athlete, right into yeah. fifteen years of assistant coaching, and this was my first year as a head coach. At twenty years total, and the thing I would say about the difference between even my era and those first couple of years of being a coach versus now is that the physical attributes of today's athlete versus back then, or even again, 10 years ago is pretty crazily different. I, I mean, you want to talk about strong, fast, uh, quick, all, all these um, athletic words that <laughs> these guys are able mm -hmm. to do. Uh, I think it's way different than, than when we played. I didn't lift weights. It wasn't a thing back then. You know, it, it was more of a yeah. trendy thing. Like no one really cared. Uh, yes, maybe some injury injury prevention things here and there. But now, if you if you don't lift weights in the collegiate uh, game, I don't care what level, what team, what program, it's going to be hard for you to compete on the field on a pretty consistent yeah. basis and or stay healthy. Um, now, where I do think there's a little advantage of the uh, that older era is just the mentality thing. I think. Um, those guys were winners. You know, they, 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 there was a lot, a lot of pride. There was a lot of, you leave it on the field, you play for your school. There was a lot of, um, just digging deep. And it, it was, it was, like I said, more of a pride thing than anything. And I'm, I'm not saying that today's athlete doesn't have that. I just don't think it's as consistent as you saw back then, uh, in, in those, in those student athletes, but, uh, both very good in their own way. I just think, again, you know, today's athlete across the board, um, all sports, I, I think they're just so athletic and, and just bigger, faster, stronger than what we what we dealt with 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I will say, too, to your point, like guys back when I played in the 80s, right, like left it out on the field, like every ounce emotion. Like whatever, if the soccer didn't do it, it was the raw desire, right? And that's how you played the game, and that was that's the way you played, and which is equally hard on its whole other set of levels, right? Because you exhaust yourself at a game, just like somebody who's just physical about it. Um, and during the season, that makes it, you know, game after game after game, it's hard to get so up for every game. Um, but you, so. How long do you think it's gonna? How long do you think it's gonna take you to for people to think of of John Carroll as your program? And I mean this respectfully, right? Sure. Like your program, and not Hector's. Not think of Hec, Hector Marinero every time they think of John Carroll soccer. And I mean, like yeah. I said, I mean that respectfully. I'm not. Yeah, and I'm gonna be equally res respectful in my response. I don't think it was ever Hector's program. And the reason why I say that is Hector was so big on always saying ours and, and uh, including me in that. And I understand from a national, maybe even regional perspective, that's hard to understand, you know, cause you don't hear him on a daily basis. But if you talk to anyone in the John Carroll circles, whether it's, you know, men's soccer alums or community uh, faculty, et cetera, I think it's always kind of been ours, you know, and that's, mm -hmm total testament to him and the kind of team player he was and the trust he put into me uh, to make me feel part of it. And I plan on doing the exact same thing. I, I don't know if I'll ever say this is my program because I, you know, from what Hector taught me, I don't think it ever is. You know, I think it's the people who came before us. It's, it's, it's still Hector's. It's still um, the guys who put on the blue and gold and, and played and um, got us to the point we're at now. So Yes, am I the, the the leader of the program now? Yeah, I, I am. Uh, but um, I'm going to kind of follow in Hector's footsteps because I think that was something that was really cool uh, that he, you know, gave me some of that ownership and and I plan to do the same with my assistant coaches and the alums and players. But you know, if you if you go talk to a men's soccer alum, it, if you said to them, "Hey, Dan said this is my program," they'll, they'll laugh because they they know I'll mm -hmm. never say. Interesting. So speaking of leadership, do you have a, like, do you have a leadership group that's part of, uh, for the program that's, you know, obviously captains or is it just captains or how does that look? Yeah. Yeah. We, we are definitely big into 
some kind of leadership group in, in different capacities. I think it kind of varies year to year uh, what the group looks like and what we think we, ne we need to do um, from a leadership standpoint. One thing that is a constant is that we always have three captains. Uh, one will wear the armband, the other two are considered assistant captains and do not wear armbands. Hector and I always believed in, and like I said, that's something I'll continue as well, that only one guy should be wearing the arm armband, kind of like the professional level. Um, the way we do it here is that it is, it, we always say it's a democracy. All of our players have a vote, our team managers, um, even our trainer, like everyone gets to vote on who they think that captain should be. Uh, so we'll go through a nomination process, then we'll come down to a, you know, if whoever got X amount of votes will go into a, on, a, on a final ballot, and then we'll vote on that. And the top vote getter will be the, the captain, and uh, the second and third guys will be the assistant captains. And then from a leadership standpoint or a leadership group standpoint, uh, what we like to do in years where we do do that is we like to have um, a representative from at least the sophomore and junior class uh, to kind of give a, you know, a younger voice or, you know, someone that's not a senior uh, in that group. And if we do think there's a freshman who is capable of that or has earned that right, we might throw them in that group too. Um, but the thing I will say that I'm assuming we're different, I, I don't know, but you know, I think a lot of people always think the best player is the captain. And here at JCU, we definitely don't roll like that. We, we think the captain is, is a leader, not, not just because someone's a good player that we just hand them the armband because they're all American or all region or all conference, whatever. So. Um, when you look at how our captain group kind of shakes out, uh, oftentimes it's not the best player on the team. And, and we can have a debate on who that guy is in terms of the best player and whatever. Um, but our guys understand that if you're going to be a captain, it's a huge responsibility. It's a lot of work. And it's someone who needs to really um, prove themselves to earn those votes rather than hey, this guy's really good and he's going to be in all the highlights and score all the goals or whatever he does, and we just hand him the armband. So I think it's, um, again, probably different is the word, but it's something that we're really comfortable with and it's been working for us for a pretty long time. Do you, it, just because you commented about freshmen, do you not play a lot of freshmen? I mean, do I know you carry a big roster, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've always seen that but do freshmen not necessarily get make that f make uh, you know the first team or i think our fr i think freshmen make the first team a lot uh for example the spring covid season uh we finished 10 0 and 0 and I, I know there was a lot of teams that didn't compete and, and weren't in these rankings but in theory we finished ranked number one in the united states uh soccer coaches association poll that spring and our entire team came back for this fall. And then so basically no one graduated. We had all of our fifth years come back to take that extra COVID eligibility year. And if you look at our stats from this fall, which was a, what, four months later, uh, three of mm -hmm. our top four scorers were freshmen that were on the team in the spring. Mm -hmm. So you know, we, we are definitely comfortable playing freshmen. Oh, yeah. If a guy is capable and, and prepared, fit and producing, we don't really care what, what age they are or, or where, they, where they come from. Uh, yeah. There's no politics here. If, you, if you're playing well, you're going to get on the field. Yeah. So you just meant the freshmen in terms from a leadership perspective. If they're, you, you might choose them as part of that leadership group if they are. There's something about them that's special from a exactly. leadership perspective. Okay. Okay. Exactly. I get that. Okay. This is where I got to flesh this out here. So. I, I mean, I have issues with you guys, long-held resentments that I have to work through. Um, I mean, how is it that you guys have been so continuously good? I just looked at your your stats, and the only the first thing I saw is that you've won five of the last six conference tournaments, right? And and I almost and I and I I feel like you know a I feel like a John Carroll football player saying, how is Mount Union so good, right? Like, um, <clears throat> and yeah, there's a tone there. You, you, you heard it. So, so, I mean, what's the, what's been your secret? I mean, look, I get the recruiting and all that. I mean, you've got some great, great players. Like, and I, I, I you know, <sighs> yeah. Yeah. What, how, how, what, what is, do you have any insight into that? Yeah. I mean, 
I wish you're I bribing them. I know. That's it. You have some trust fund that you give these kids as the, to come. Yeah, I, I wish I had a cool, sexy answer to tell you. I mean, he's a lawyer. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, um, it kind of goes back to when Hector and I took over back in 2006. Um, the reality is Hector had never coached. I had never coached. We came in together, and we were literally learning on the fly every day. Um, and, and like you said you know, earlier uh, before this video started, like kind of making mistakes and just trying to figure it out as you go, right? Yeah. Um, we started off, I think it was 07 and 04, our first year. I like that. that that's more like it. Uh, then we had to win, I believe it was our last five conference games to even get in the OEC tournament that year. Um, we we paid our dues. You know, we really had to throw stuff against the wall and see what stuck and, and uh, figure it out the hard way, essentially. And I think once we started getting our, our wits together and uh, learning from these mistakes, because as you mentioned before, you know, being a competitor, and, and, and I don't know a bigger competitor than Hector Marinero when it comes to that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's... That <laughs> is, you know, <laughs> so we came back in 2007 and won the conference that year. Um, in a year we should not have won. You know, the, we had lost we lost three com conference games that regular season, and we ended up beating those three teams in the quarter semis and finals uh, to win yeah. the in 2007. And then we were kind of in and out of the picture there for a couple of years. Uh, but we're, in my opinion, things really took a turn for the positive on a consistent basis that was sustainable. Was Hector and I sat down, and I, re I still remember it to this day, it was – Christmas Eve, uh, my family owns a soccer store in Parma. Uh, we met in the back room there. We weren't even at John Carroll. And we sat down and we're like, we got to figure this out. And we made some adjustments to our recruiting tactics and responsibilities and, and things like that. Um, uh, that was the day he he named me the associate head coach and recruiting coordinator in, the, in that back room. And we shuffled some stuff around and um, things kind of started popping for us. And uh, again, Good coaches, you know, yes, they manage players and games and whatever. But if you don't have good players, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. for them. And yeah. uh, Hector will say the same thing if he was in this in this conversation. Uh, the credit goes to the players. I mean, these these guys have really committed themselves. They do all the right things, uh, not only during the season, the off season, off the field, in the classroom. Um, they've just completely taken this thing to a whole nother level from their standard. Because uh, Hector and I were trying to bring it 100% all the time, obviously, but I really feel that uh, hump we had to had to get over was on, on their side of stuff uh, to understand what it took to win. And once they kind of figured that out, we just try to make it bigger and better every year and keep the foot on the gas and don't look back. Yeah. Well, if something's working, much to my chagrin, I'll still do some research on that, you know, bribes and stuff like that. I'm sure it's got to happen that way. This is the other question I have to ask, and I mentioned this before we started recording that I'm doing three, I, two, well, you're the first, I have one tomorrow, um, and then uh, hopefully a third lined up uh, here next week. Uh, so the OAC is known as a football conference, I think, for the most part, right? Like. There's three to four teams that could easily be in the national national rankings. I, th do you think that has any impact on you as a soccer program, or, or, you know, I know f from Mount Union's perspective, right? Like, what it's done for the school, what, what Mount Union's football has done for the school is just nothing short of remarkable right from when i went there to what it is now i mean it doesn't even look the same right it's just exploded um, but do you have any thoughts on that just sort of the the quality of football i mean marietta's got basket like just some real other sports that are such high level yeah i at, at john carroll i don't think any sport in particular is that school sport, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I don't think mm -hmm. it's a soccer school. I don't think it's a football school. Um, I think it's a a very competitive sports school in general. You know, For example, um, John Carroll men just won the all-sports trophy for the seventh year in a row in the OAC. 
which is pretty remarkable when you talk about, again, Mount Union football, um, yeah. Marietta basketball, Marietta baseball, yeah. VW baseball, yeah. just the College World Series. I mean, there's some really good athletic programs in this conference yeah. that are super competitive and, and at a at high high clip at, at the national level. But, you know, here at JCU, we're really lucky that I feel that our athletic department is kind of uh, um, like a family, uh, truthfully. Uh, you know, our men's track and field team just finished second uh, in the nation at the, in the national championships uh, at Spire. Um, we had multiple champions uh, in the, the 5K and 10K, Jamie Daly and Alex Phillip. Um, in here, everyone kind of works together. Specifically, when, when it comes to football, uh, great relationship with the football program. Uh, Coach Rick Finati, who just actually retired here a couple of weeks ago, um, one of our biggest advocates. I mean, he, on a daily basis, is you know texting, calling uh, about games and whatever our results and what have you. Their assistant coaches. Um, now Drew Nystrom, who's our uh, interim head coach, Jeff Long. I mean, these guys are, are I mean, we're in group chats together. We're all, we're recruiting for each other. We're helping each other out. Uh, so I don't think there's ever been a, a competition in between the sports, at least here at JCU. Now, I can't speak for other programs um, in the conference, but for me, you know, the more recognition the OAC can get, I don't, I don't care what sport it is. It's, it's good for all of us. Uh, I think in, in terms of, the OAC football, yes, it's known as a, a top football conference in the country, mainly because of Mount Union. And then, you know, John Carroll, Northern, BW is kind of normally sprinkled yeah. with the two, three, and four teams. And like you said, are nationally ranked. But we could say the same thing about soccer. I mean, there, there's it's a very good soccer conference. Uh, I'm yeah. not trying to sit here and compare us to the NESCAC or anything like that. But yeah. um, every year, especially I would say the last four or five years, there's an argument that three or four teams should be in the national tournament on, on the men's soccer side of stuff. Yeah. Um, and you could say the same about the women's side as well. So I think, you know, my answer here at JCU might be different than the other OEC coaches that, you, that you'll interview in a couple of days. But from what I see, I, I kind of take it as a positive. The, the more press yeah. and the marketing we get, I think the better off we are. Yeah. Like I said, I think for the schools, like the success just feeds upon itself. And like I said, just as the test case, Mount Union, it's remarkable what that place looked that what what we've what the school's been able to do um because of that success well i think it was sort of the catalyst right like it, of just sort of driving a lot of that so hey look how 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 difficult was or easy was the that covid year um okay you don't have to say anything else that's pretty clear um, no, like, was it tough? Was it that tough? It was, uh, I mean, it was the most difficult coaching job by a mile in the 16 years that I've, I've been a coach. Um, wow. I, the credit I give to our players, you know, our student athletes, our athletic trainers, our administration, our AD, our AD, Michelle Morgan, I mean, what, what they had to do. Um, to even have a chance to play was remarkable. Um, the amount of sacrifice that the players had to, to make in terms of their social lives and, and how they literally operated on a day-to-day -day basis uh, was remarkable. I mean, we asked them to do so many things um, that I couldn't imagine doing myself when I was a student athlete here uh, to the point where we kind of did the NFL opt-in, opt-out before the spring season. We're like, hey, listen, here are the rules. This is what we're going to do. If you don't want to do it, we totally understand. It's there's no 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 bad no hard feelings or anything like that. Um, if you want to go be a college kid, you can go do that. But if you want to play, this is what we're going to have to do. And we basically took whatever the NCAA rules were given to JCU. JCU took them and kind of made their um, they interpreted you know to their law, but maybe a little little harsher. And I think we took those rules that JCU gave us and even doubled down on them to the point where we wore masks during practice. Uh, we, we were outside yeah. in January and February, and I, I still feel bad to this day, but we just felt it was the best chance for our guys to win. Uh, but we were literally wearing masks during training, all of us, guys playing, uh, guys coaching. Uh, but what they did and how they did it was something I'll never forget. And, and to even try to put it in the same boat as another difficult season, I, I, I can't. It, it, it was really, yeah. really tough. Yeah, just that. 
I have yet to hear anybody say that it was a fun time, you know, <laughs> like it was um, somebody I was speaking with said that they, they, they went from being a head coach to being like chief therapist and psychologist for 30 guys. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. It's crazy. I mean, the reality is, you know, every day you woke up, you didn't know who was going to be at training that night. Uh, yeah. every, you, your phone rang and it's, it's terrible to have a pessimistic attitude, but it was hard not to like. Every time you saw a phone ring or a text, you just thought it was a guy telling you, hey, I just tested yeah. positive or I'm sick or whatever. Yeah. Um, it was a roller coaster uh, yeah. ride for, you know, four or five months. And yeah. that that feeling of walking off the field and, you know, after winning the OEC final that spring, after everything we've been through, it, it was one of the best feelings I, I, I've ever had, you know, putting on a, a John Carroll top, whether it was coaching. Yeah, yeah. Hey, just shifting gears a little bit, the you know how the NCAA or has now agreed to get rid of the um, the um, overtimes during the regular season. Do you have any thoughts on that? Not, not a big fan. Um, I I'm all about player safety. I'm all about you know managing our players and, and keeping them in the safest space possible. I just think it kind of takes away some really special moments and some really awful moments too that you learn from uh, with that overtime rule. I, I think, yes, it's it, it stinks when a player has to play 110 minutes twice in a week if you do go to overtime and play the full time uh, in, in a four or five day span. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it was a really cool thing that players. Uh, got some of their best memories from, you know, me, me even in particular, I remember from when I played and whatever. And um, again, I understand the thought process. I understand uh, the rationale behind it. I'm just, like I said, not, not that big of a fan. And um, then you kind of switch gears into the tournament and now we're going to play two full 10 minute overtimes and things like that. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't like to go against the grain too much, but I, I, I'd be lying to you if I, if I, if I told you I like yeah. Is that going to change the way you coach a game during the season? Like, are you going to, do you think you're going to make changes knowing that, oh my gosh, I don't have, I don't have, what, 35 minutes. I only have 15 minutes to resolve this game. Sure. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. I think, uh, I think you kind of have to, right? I mean, you, you have to coach with what's, what you're given. And I do think it's going to affect a lot of us. And, um, I, I think it might end up hurting the better teams. You know what I mean? The, mm -hmm. the, the teams that um, get the, the bus parked on them and whatever, and they get to the 75th minute and the shots are 25 to three and that kind of stuff. You know, you lose 20 minutes of, of you know, getting a chance to, to try to go to get a win. And I think it's going to, there's going to be a lot of ties. I'll put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I do, I do think, I mean, that's a good point, right? Like if I'm, you know, if I'm Paul College somewhere and I'm showing up at John Carroll, you know, for a midweek game, you know, I, I, my whole job might be to figure out how to just keep you in front and not, not let you get a goal and, and sort of play it out that way. Right. And, you know, a tie at John Carroll away, PowerPoints, all that kind of stuff. Like you're... I mean, that's meaningful. So, yeah, I would totally – I could totally see you guys playing for ties. Right. It's, it's, it wouldn't be – it wouldn't surprise me. I, I think that I, – all the, everyone I've spoken to says, oh, that runs contrary to what I want to do as a coach. You know, I always step out there to win every game. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, at some point reality comes, you know, and you're like, yeah, I don't think I can beat these guys even on a – you know, if they have a bad day. So – you know, maybe they start they start playing for ties, right. and uh, yeah, that's a good thought. Do you? Are, and I don't. I, I'm thinking now in terms of what I would think Hector would do. Like, do you have any non-negotiables for your for your for your team? Are there things rules that you? You want to be a part of this program that you have to abide by. Yeah, I, I mean, like anyone else, we have a set of team rules and, again, day-to-day -day stuff and whatever. But 
I think the thing that things that we really focus on in the bigger picture is that we want our guys to be the best version of themselves. Okay, so um, I'm not going to ask a kid to get a 4.0 if he's only capable of getting a 3.5. I'm not going to ask a forward to score 20 goals if he really is a 7, 8, 9 goal guy. You know, being the best version of yourself and pushing yourself to that standard and maybe a little bit beyond it and, and giving everything you can to be – uh, in that category, when you look in the mirror and say, "Hey, listen, I gave everything I got." So from 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 that standpoint, like I said, you know, academics is really important to us. It's the primary focus here. It's the reason why anybody should come to John Carroll in the first place. Not because you like a coach. Not because uh, we have a good team or whatever. They should be coming here because because they're co- they're going to get a great degree, uh, unbelievable preparation for the for the real world internship and, and job uh, opportunities and great starting salaries, things like that. Uh, so that's obviously, they're, you know, we're going to focus on that and to make sure that they're being the best academics possible. Um, the soccer side of stuff, you know, we always tell our guys, no matter where you go and what you do, you're representing all of us at, at JCU, whether it's a soccer program in the community, whatever. So um, trying to find a way to make a positive impact is really important to us. I don't care if it's holding the door open for someone who's walking behind you or uh, shooting someone a text or giving them a phone call to, to thank them for something that they did for you or whatever, something that's going to brighten somebody's day. Um, and, and doing that um, in the whole like Jesuit, like men and women for others, you know, that model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I really believe in that. We're really big into service. Uh, we have a kids kicking a cancer clinic with uh, rainbow babies and children that we bring in kids who – uh, are either fighting or, or to survive cancer uh, bouts. You know, mm-hmm. we do uh, a clinic for autism, which was actually my senior year project when I was a student here, where we bring in 30 to 40 students from the Cleveland, <coughs> the Cleveland <coughs> Center for Autism, and we put them through a clinic as well. Uh, we work with the Max Cure Foundation. So we try to find ways to help our guys understand there's a lot more in life than just the game, right? Um, yeah you want to walk out of here a much better person and having a positive impact on the world. So when it comes to the non-negotiables, it kind of revolves around those things, you know, the, Mm -hmm. uh, the academics, the athletics, and obviously uh, you as a human being. And, and if I'm ranking those things, the soccer portion is probably third. Yeah. yeah. I forgot you guys are Jesuit. So you got that going for you. I, I will say like, um, I know I've been asking this as of coaches as well, just because it's, I always want, I wondered it, you know, because the season is so tight, like how much preparation do you put into understanding the team you're going to be playing? Like how much work do you do and how much, how much of that information do you pass on to, to the team? And I'm thinking you're playing two, three games a week. Like how, how, how do you manage that? Yeah. I, I mean, Preparation is really important to us. Uh, we definitely have film sessions twice a week, uh, every Monday and Friday. You know, Monday, obviously, we're reviewing the film from the weekend and preparing for the opponent midweek. And then same thing goes on Friday, reviewing the film from Wednesday and then preparing for the opponent on the weekend. I think that we're kind of a little bit of a hybrid of uh, – we we want to play our, our brand of soccer. We're very possession-oriented, on-the-ball kind of team. Uh, but we will make adjustments in formation based on what we see in um, in other teams. And, and honestly, I, again, I don't think this is any secret or uh, any other OA season of like hear this and, and like, oh, I didn't know that. You know, we change our formation a lot, um, and it's again back to the players' credit. They they're comfortable with it. They want to do it. They understand why we do it. And I think we have the players to do it. And I think it makes us pretty hard to prepare for because I don't think other teams really know what formation we're going to show up on a given day. And um, again, I'm comfortable with it as a coach because I know our guys can do it and and they're prepared to do it because of the the work we put on it during film and scout and um, the tactics on the field during training sessions and stuff like that. So um, there is quite a a bit of work that goes into it. We try to take the burden of that as a coaching staff and really condense it so that it's not a – a lot of work from a player, a student athlete standpoint, you know, we want to do all that work. We're going to get all that information and then give, give them the highlights of it. So they know uh, what they're should be looking for, preparing for and, mm-hmm. and take that and apply it to their own game and their role and whatever the responsibility is. Uh, but yeah, I think it's really important to, 
understand your opponent and, and again every factor we playing on grass we playing home we playing away what's the weather like is it a day game a night game I, I think all those little variables in the equation matter and uh, we try to give them as much information in that in, in that equation so they can solve the problem would it be too bold to ask is it do you have a preferred formation or is there like a base formation that you play that you're four four two and then you know and then from there oh we'll come up with something different as needed or yeah not really I, it, it, like a personal standpoint like selfishly i really i've never really gravitated towards one that i think is um mm -hmm. or not basically the way i would kind of explain it is i think the question is do you want to play with three backs or you want to play with four backs and then you kind of work from there um mm -hmm. and we've done it both ways and we'll can probably continue <laughs> to, do it, to do it both ways but uh, I think that's kind of where everything starts. If you're comfortable, if you have three guys that you feel comfortable with back there, then obviously you have a lot of options, you know, for the rest of the players yeah. with them, what you're going to do in the formation. Now, if, if, if you're not, or, or you, you, you do yeah. want to play with, with uh, fullbacks and uh, what have you, then obviously th that changes the, the equation a little bit. But I think that's normally where we start. We try to start, you know, putting stuff on the board and, and figuring things out. Yeah. Yeah. Huh, that's a good point, right? Like it is true. Like that decision alone, forget, forget midfield, forget the forward line. It all comes down to three or four in the back. No doubt. And, and then that that'll that'll drive. Okay, so now we could go four in the middle, or maybe we could step somebody up even higher now, right? Like big difference. Yeah, I, I think the other I think where I'm probably a little box <coughs> is that, and this is even back when I was an assistant with Hector, and and, we, and he kind of did the same thing. We would never put a lineup together until at the earliest, and this is even early August first. Like we we will look at our roster and we'll you know add guys in there in our 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 Google spreadsheet or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of putting players on the board and start thinking tactics, we won't we never allowed ourselves to do that until August because um, the way I always explained it to Hector and now to the current coaching staff is there's so many things that can change between now and then. You're kind of spinning your wheels and. You're probably not going to yeah. do it anyway. So I kind of let the dust yeah, settle. Yeah. You got to see who's fit and healthy and, um, you know, what freshman steps up and is ready to roll and mm -hmm. things like that. So, yeah, we yeah. we wait as long as we can until we have to do it so we don't waste time kind of going over stuff that probably isn't going to happen anyway. Yeah. Do you, um, when does your preseason start this year? So we will move in on August 17th. Our administration day will be the 18th. And then our first practice will be the 19th. And then we open up, I believe it is September 1st, we will be at Oberlin. Oberlin? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just, you know, because I'm going to totally scout you guys to figure out a plan. <clears throat> um, okay, so let, let, uh, before I go into the fun part... The one I was really wanting to talk about was what's the what what sort of were your expectations going into the, into this year, um, you know, knowing everything that went on, and then here you're back for a full season, I, and and again you guys killed it. I mean, Sweet Sixteen, I mean that's that's pretty significant. I mean I can't think that you that's what you expected, but did you think you were going to be that good? I, I did, I, honestly. I, I Again, I don't think it had anything to do with, with coaching or <laughs> any of that stuff. I mean, we knew the kind of players that we had and uh, the kind of experience we were bringing back, including the, the new players we were bringing in, the, the freshmen I referred to. So I, I we knew that was totally possible. I If I'm being totally honest, the expectation always is to try to win the comp, right? I think you have to respect every step in the process you can't go from a to z you have to go to a b c d before you get anywhere near z and i think that's always mm -hmm. the first task at hand you, you have to go and get into the national tournament first like yes you know we try to um create our schedule that we give ourselves a little bit of a cushion if that doesn't happen and um, have a high sos and play quality opponents so that that large bid is is there you know or, or, or we're capable of, of, of getting that um, but the expe expectation is, is trying to get into the national tournament. And for us, the way we want to do that is to win our conference. And um, beyond that, the, it's, uh, 
it's the tournament, right? Anything can happen. So we yeah. kind of want to get to the dance and give ourselves a chance before we start putting expectations and, um, you know, trying to think about what we're capable of or not capable of. But um, in terms of this group, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I thought we had a really good spring. Uh, I would definitely argue and, and tell you that it was the best spring I've seen in my 20 years at Carroll, inclu including me as a player. I, I was blown away by the amount of work that was put in between November to, to March and what these guys look like coming off of, like you said, a Sweet 16 and playing at a really high level and how they showed up in March uh, and competed on the field. So from that standpoint, I think the guys did a really good job. I, I, I don't know if I yelled once during the spring, but they, they really, I mean, they were, they were great. I, I, I can't complain at all. Now, that was one step of the, the A to Z, right? There's a lot more to go here this summer, and uh, they got to continue doing that and, and staying on that path. But, um, yeah, I would tell you that our expectation is to try to compete and win the conference again because that's going to get us to where we want to go. I think – I don't think you guys had to worry, right? This Not had to worry, but um... – this year, right? I mean, I think you were getting in whether you won the tournament or not, right? I think your strength of schedule, definitely your record. Um, so you guys were in a great position regardless. I mean, winning the tournament's great, and I mean that just makes life easier. But um, okay, <clears throat> so I do have to talk to you about the snowball, right? Because. I spoke with Coach Craig Appleby of Johns Hopkins. I, I, I don't even know how long I've been doing this already. So it must have been like three months ago. I don't know. Um, and, and I brought that up because if you've ever played in northeastern Ohio, you kind of come to expect a November game to possibly have what seemed at times like a blizzard. Like and you just sort of go about your normal day of business. I, I think it I, I think I think they I, I don't think they were necessarily ready for that. Um just because they like to own the ball the way they love to play, and I think it just sort of totally disjointed them, which is in fairness, right? Like I, I could a lot of teams that would happen. And I just wanted to get your perspective on that on that game because I, I watched parts of it and again, Northeastern Ohio, it almost felt like it was a charge for you guys. Like, hey, it's snowing and we're playing and um, and it just really propelled you to to go after it more. Right. But I just want to hear your perspective. Yeah. So driving into campus on that Sunday morning, there wasn't any snow on the ground. Everything was fine. You know, and as I kind of like I was kind of pacing from my office to the door, just kind of because I, I knew it was coming and I, I would kind of look. I'm like, oh, it's not too bad and not too. And then I got to the point where I'm like, this is awful. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how we're going to play today, you know. So uh, I went and had a meeting um, with the NCAA representative, uh, RAD, uh, Craig. Um, you know, we're talking about options and whatever. And I have to give a. A ton of credit to our facility staff and our assistant or our, excuse me our women's head coach mike modic everyone was on the field with shovels trying to get the lines uh shoveled and the plow was going whatever but truthfully walking into that first half my personal perspective was this field is going to hurt both teams tremendously because like you said yeah. you know they want to be on the ball and play and it was a really weird you know guys are trying to figure out their footing they're slipping the ball stopping yeah uh, it was a really just ugly ugly first half and uh they scored on a pk and again we can sit here and debate all day you know, does that happen if the snow the guy slips it, it, it's you know it's yeah. part of the game you got to deal with it and, and move on but um towards the end of that first half i felt like we were really starting to get some momentum and and stringing some passes together and, and figuring it out and, and again to your point i think our guys who you know most are from northeast ohio or have dealt with these inclement weather conditions they just mm -hmm. figured it out a little bit quicker because they grew up here. Um, but then the really odd thing happened where you come to the halftime talk with the referees. And again, instead of black representative, Craig, myself, and the two options were, Hey, we go have halftime and come back out here in 15 minutes and we just deal with it. Or do we take a 45 minute break and get this field plowed because there is a break in the radar. 
and yeah. selfishly, um, like I said, I felt like we were we were starting to take uh, control of the game a little bit, and you don't want to kill your momentum. Um, yeah. But I knew it wasn't right uh, ethically uh, for them. It, 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 I wouldn't have slept well if I if I just said Let, let's go back out there and not not did the right thing. It was the right thing yeah. to get the field clear because there was going to be a break in the snow, and that's what we did. It was very odd to have that long of a halftime, and you know you kind of <laughs> sat and just waited and waited and waited. Uh, but you know, luckily for us, our guys uh, they stayed ready and loose, and they got back out there and took care of business. But I, I think one of the, the one of the funnier stories, just in hindsight, was. You know, we scored the goal to tie it 1-1. And then our one of our freshman forwards, his name's Jack Fogue, who, again, was one of those three of the four leading scorers that I referenced earlier in, in the discussion. He was dead. I mean, he, he played a lot the day before. He, he needed a break. And I had a sub at midfield for him maybe for, for five, five or six minutes waiting for him to go in. And he is literally just dragging. And I was just trying to get him five, ten minutes, and I was going to put him back in because he was playing great. Well, sure enough, ball comes down, he breaks through, he scores the goal and puts us up two one. He could he was too tired to even celebrate. I mean he literally like yeah. ball the field, we threw the other our, our sub in there, um, got him his five, ten minutes and he went to finish the game, but um, I'm glad the ball didn't go out of bounds <laughs> yeah. because who knows what would have happened. But yeah, he I was trying to sub him out because he was asking for one, which is definitely not his style. He he he'll play through a lot. Yeah. He was that tired, and we just got lucky that the ball didn't go out. So that's I, I forgot that. Like I didn't even think about that. That that's the that's the second game in two days, right? Like that, that, you know, and you you played a relatively normal game, and then you go into, and that's that's what you're dealing with, which definitely tires. Like anybody who's played in the snow knows that there's something about it. Everything's heavier. Your boots are heavier. The ball's heavier. Trying to make a pass is a struggle. Um, keeping your feet is a struggle. Um, I got a kick out of it. I, I mean, I scoreboard, no scoreboard. I was, I was laughing. I was loving it. I was like, guys would run and the ball would sort of stop and they'd keep going because they couldn't stop. Otherwise, they'd wipe out. I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is back home, right? Like, it was, it was kind of normal. It, it was incredible. And I give... Johns Hopkins, a lot of credit. That I, I don't know his name, forgive me, but their left center back was a fantastic player, and he yeah. was really good at making whoever that target forward work was. And yeah. that happened to be Jack, you know, and that's why yeah. he probably needed us up because he was chasing that guy all over the place. But yeah, um, yeah, to your point, like running in snow, you might as well be running in sand. It, it, it's sand. It's, yeah, it's, it's no fun. That's for sure. No, no, no. Um. Yeah, and I, I credit to Craig. He's like, look, it's you got to deal with it, and they dealt. You guys, John Carroll dealt with it better. But I could, I, I, I think in his mind is like, man, if the if the snow wasn't there, is the game different? And because of the way they play, right, and the way they they really like to own the ball and all those things. And I think that's a fair. I mean, I think that was a fair question to ask. I think it would have been cool to see you guys on a you know, on a it could be cold, but on a good field, right, where the ball isn't so much, you know, snow isn't the issue or inclement weather isn't the issue. Uh, yeah, he, um, I know another factor for Craig was he was missing a couple guys. He told me. Yeah, he mentioned that too. A yeah. couple key guys. I know we had a guy who we didn't play on Saturday because we knew it was our center back, and he ended up having hernia surgery after the season, but we knew there was no way he could play two games in a row. So we – Literally yeah. only we didn't play him on Saturday. We had him rostered, to, hoping we would win yeah. Sunday. Um, and then one of our seniors, uh, Larry Sersosimo, he had a, a seizure during the season in the, in the library studying. Oh my God! He was out for the year, so we both had some guys that would have been some pretty yeah, 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 yeah factors. And it's just yeah, you know, it's soccer in November instead of like yeah, yeah. Well, that's it, right? Like I, I've I've been saying, especially as I've been talking to coaches, like to me that. It, 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 you have to have a good team, right? Like, but let's, you have to have the good players to, to think you can get somewhere and make a run and get through the season. But then I think it comes down to when tournament time comes, whether it's conference tournament or, or the NCAAs, it's how healthy are you? 
And how, how many Band-Aids can you put on guys and still keep them functioning, right, to get them through, okay, you got to play this game, and then you're not going to do anything for four days until you recover, and then you got another game, and you're just sort of just trying to manage. I think that's the trick, is managing that situation um, more so than, again, the quality of your team, which is important, but I think it ends up being like, you got four guys out this game. I got, you know, you got three. Like, how how impactful is that? No doubt. And not to get too off topic, you know, it goes back to this whole, um, and guys like Brandon Bianco from Denison are pushing, you know, for us to have to play two games in a weekend in the NCAA yeah. tournament, and forget the Final Four, I'm talking about at any point, is just ridiculous. You know, they've they yeah. got to figure out a way for us to be at least playing, like, Friday, Sunday, or something, like, give these kids yeah. a, a 24-hour uh, recovery yeah. window uh, or whatever, because um, you're asking a lot, and um, and who knows, you know, maybe if that 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 game is a day later, Craig has his two guys back, you know, you know like yeah, yeah, things that that go into that equation. That's a that's a story for another day, but yeah. um, it's unfortunate that you're able to kind of avoid that the entire season, and then you get to the pinnacle yeah. of that national tournament, and then we ask our guys to go do that. Yeah, I always said. <clears throat> and, I, you know, I know there's the push, and part of this is the, you know, the Sasha Kurowski at, at, at um, Maryland is pushing that, what is it, Project 21st Century, whatever it is, to extend the season and all this. And, and I keep thinking, man, what if you just got an extra week? What if you got a week on the front end? So instead of you, were, you your first practice being August 19th, it's now August 12th. Sure. And then just... What what would that make your schedule? And you're able to start earlier, your your first game earlier, a, a week earlier, let's say. And what does that do to your entire schedule? And does that make it better for the student athletes to play and recover? It, it I, I got to think, like, you could go from, you know, you might have three weeks where you're going to be able to go Saturday to Saturday rather than one week or whatever the current number is, just because you've bought yourself that extra time. Um, not, not that anyone listens to me about these rules, by the way, it's just easy for me to say, <laughs> like, I think of these things for some reason. I don't know why, but, um, Hey, so what, what, what would you say surprised you the most about, about this team of, of many great things I'm sure you could say? It, it's probably, it probably didn't hit me until well after the season ended and, and we were probably in like Christmas time, New Year's, whatever, but just kind of all the different variables that these guys had to face um, that weren't their fault i guess is how I'll, I'll frame it i mean one you have hector retiring right you know that that's yeah. uh um something that i'm sure they weren't prepared to deal with right and then i'm, I'm essentially the, the new head yeah. coach whatever, even though i had been around the program for a long time and guys knew who i who i was whatever it's still an adjustment period that was one uh two i had my first child on august 6th which was like two weeks before we had our first season so i got a baby at home and God bless my wife. She's a rock star and, you know, the, the real MVP, as Kevin Durant would say, uh, of, of, of my situation, you know, getting up all night with, with the baby and doing all those things. Then you follow it up on August 2nd, or excuse me, October 2nd, my assistant coach, Ante Pilikic, his wife has their second son uh, during oh the season. So we have two, two infant babies in the, in the <coughs> So these guys just kind of picking us up and helping us out, you know, and, and I don't think – um, the family situation never affected the game, but uh, they made our lives easier. They knew what we were dealing with and, and, and what was mm -hmm. on our plate and whatever. And they were always going above and beyond to make sure things were getting done and, and being responsible and accountable. And like I said, just making our life easier. So when you're going through it, I don't think you really think about it because you're just grinding and, you know, you're, you're on to the next day and you keep going. Yep. And going. But when you actually sit down and, and you stop and you're like, yeah, wow, that was the first year where I'm technically like the head coach, and then I had a kid, and Ante had a kid, <laughs> and uh, Hector's gone, and like all these things, and and you went, you made it, you, you win the OAC double for the fourth year in a row, and go to the Swiss. Yeah. Like, you, you just don't when it's happening. You just, <laughs> you know, so I think 
it was probably like I said around New Year's where I kind of one day I'm like that was crazy I can't believe <laughs> did that um, but again I think I said it I said it ten times probably during this 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 call like it's the players I mean these guys are just incredible yeah. human beings and um, they're fully committed to what we do and I can't thank them enough for everything they did for me my family the program the school and they were just great rep representatives of John Carroll University yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, yeah, your wife is a rock star if you're in the middle of dealing with the season and you have a newborn. Here's, yeah. the, crazy, here's the crazier part. She uh, she played volleyball at JCU. Um, she had a, a retail job manager or whatever. Long story short, she ended up coming back to get her MBA. Uh, so she technically was the GA for the volleyball team during the fall <laughs> season as well. So she was going All to right. Uh, coaching the team and watching Luca, our son, at, at home. I, I still don't know how she did it. Um, maybe I should just ditch you right now and just talk to her because <laughs> she's... <laughs> she's... I don't know. Yeah, like I'm going to shift this over all things Division Three volleyball just for one. <laughs> um, hey, what, what, what kind of expectations do you have for the fall? Or fall, uh, for a month from now yeah I, I kind of goes back to again i think these guys um need to pick off pick up where we left off i i think we have a huge challenge in front of us we lost some really talented players in this senior class um that were very monumental in our success um i think our guys see it as an opportunity because it's kind of like it's, it's our turn kind of mentality uh, i think they they're up for that challenge and um, I think we need to be very respectful to the process. Uh, we know what it, what it takes to get to where we want to go. And we have to put in the work on a daily basis to get there. We can't just expect uh, teams to lay down and, and let us get there. If anything, I don't know if our bullseye on our back has ever been bigger as a soccer program. In John oh, Carson. it's like ginormous, man. <laughs> I, I know. I've heard from a lot of coaches in the offseason – what are you going to do now that Will Turretson graduated? You know, that's been the common, yeah. uh, comment I've gotten. But, uh, yeah, uh, you have to move forward. You have to find a way. There's no excuses. We have the talent. We have the players. Uh, but we need to put put in the work, and we need to do what we need to do uh, to put ourselves in the best position to win the OAC again. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. The OAC is going to be very good this year. Very, very good. You know, it, it is – So, you know, this all started because I joined some message board on D3Soccer.com and guys were talking and there's a few like really knowledgeable ones. And one of the guys would, would say like the ones the the conference to look out at as the, that doesn't get enough credit is the OAC for how tough it is and how good the soccer really is. And I watched Otterbein a couple times. I watched you guys a couple times, obviously Mount Union when I could. Um, <clears throat> and... I, the soccer is better than it's ever been that I can remember, and and and, and to your credit, to John Carroll, much as it pains me, <laughs> to your credit, like you guys can be contenders. Like I don't know, I don't want to be this Sports Illustrated curse for you guys, but you really, I mean, you're you guys are at a level that if you know. You get that through the season, and you get those those right breaks and all that stuff. Like I could easily see you there there again, Sweet Sixteen, right, and making it to the to the semis, and then all bets are off at that point, right? Because it's too real, you know. You know, you're just going up against the best of the best. Like honestly, I could totally see that. Yeah, and especially if you get enough snow games in there from you know southern teams, like. You know, it's like Trinity comes and visits you and you're in a blizzard. Like, that's not a, like I said, I, I totally think you guys could be there. No, I appreciate that. I mean, God, I, I just, ah, <laughs> the thing I'll tell you, you know, people ask me all the time, and I get, maybe this is like a football question that people try to ask soccer people, um, you know, who's your rival? And yeah, I, I'm, everybody, I mean, the OAC is really like, all nine teams that we play in a given year, we can beat them and they can beat us. And, yeah, and yeah. they're 
every game's a dogfight. Everyone at that yeah. point has, again, scouted their opponents, see each other playing a bunch. They they know what to do or what the plan is, whatever, the blueprint. Um, it's it's an absolute dogfight. And then yeah. you know, and then you got to go to the, you know, God willing, if you get to the OAC playoffs, a like quarter semifinal situation in a week, it's, it's wild. But going to the, you know, I was fortunate enough to go to the Sweet 16 once as a player in 2003 and once as a coach. 2003 was a long time ago. And yes, I have some memories as a player of what happened and whatever, but what being there that weekend in Amherst, I think was a huge learning um, yeah. moment for not only for myself, who's been part of D3 soccer for 20 years, but our players. And, and it's not, yeah, you can go on, on TV and, or the internet and watch a game and the, the final when you're there and you're yeah. living it, there's, yeah. you Different. can't replicate that. And yeah. watching the Amherst, watching, uh, playing, uh, excuse me, playing against Middlebury, like, there are some really, really good programs in this country, and they play yeah. soccer at a very high level. And I think yeah. that learning moment for us was really impactful. And I'll argue probably why these guys train so hard this off season uh, going because they felt it and they saw it. Yeah, they know there's a long way to go, and and we yeah. gotta, you know, put that work in if we want to be considered one of those top teams with those with those with those schools. And yeah. again, like. The Amherst right back. I feel like that kid should be an MLS. I mean, he's just an absolute machine. And the, the, I was I was really impressed with him. Yeah, I'm not a big Amherst fan. Like I know that's terrible to say, but I'm not a big fan of what they play, how they play, and sort of the rah rah and all that stuff. But he's good. And and um, what's his name? The uh, the player of the year. I mean, that guy is another one. Like, Holy yeah. smokes! Like a different level, different level. Yeah, incredible. Different level. Hey, UK. We talk a little bit about recruiting, and then I'll let you get on. Well, I'll let you go home to take a nap yeah. because you're probably exhausted at this point. Um, do you you know those uh, recruiting websites? You know, and see they send out the emails and they try. Do you use those at all, or are you? Are you much more in tune to the to the scene that you're recruiting into and don't necessarily need that type of help? I personally do not. And I don't want to use the I'm not a fan line like I did earlier. I just feel like I would like to have a little more personal connection with the recruit. I think it kind of works both ways. I don't think a recruit wants to get a, uh, an email from me that 700 other kids are getting as well. Right? <laughs> like you wanted to be personal, personalized. I, it always it always kind of makes me laugh. I'll get a, I'll get a like Coach Mladenovic. I can't wait to be a Viking, and I'm like, well, we're <laughs> you're trying to do go that. Gophers. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I I understand why they're there. I, I do think it's useful um, in certain programs, certain situations. I think it's a personal preference, and for me, I just like I said, I, I don't prefer that. I'd rather get on a phone call, a Zoom. A, or yeah. just a normal email thread with, with the the, the PSA and, and talk to him that way, um, but no, we rely on big time on relationships. You know, guys that we trust, club coaches, uh, high school yeah. programs that we that we know. And um, there's a, a lot of guys out there that I, I'll say eight to ten guys consistently where I don't have to see a kid play if he tells me about him and he's that strong about his belief in him. I'm already kind of sold, and I'll go watch yeah. it to kind of confirm it. But yeah. I, I rely on those things much more than the recruiting websites. Yeah, I don't know if it's any different. It doesn't sound like it's any different. But when I was there, I was Mount Union grad, and then I went to Kent State, and I hung around Northeastern Ohio for a couple of years. Um, the soccer coaching community is real. Like if you're tapped into it, it's really tight and pretty wide. And, and, you know, yeah, I could totally see you getting a phone call from somebody who coaches, you know, out in Toledo and says, I got a kid, like, okay. who's going to fit, who'd be, and you, I could totally, I would, knowing the guys who were there when I was there, I'd be like, yep, I'm not, I don't need to see, see this player. He's, if that's what he's telling me, then I know from, I know he's a good ball player. Um, what do you, what what are your thoughts on like the all the showcase tournaments that are out there? 
Um, do you do you like showcases or or do you focus more on your ID camps? I love showcases. I I, I think. I think they're great. I, I just think there's probably a little too many of them right now. Um, yeah. We've kind of shifted our focus onto certain types of showcases, whether it be, you know, USYS, National League Pro, yeah. uh, ECNL, MLS Next, things like that, uh, where we're putting ourselves in a situation where we're probably competing more with Division One programs for a player than Division Three, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I think facility matters too. You know, I think – Going down to Disney uh, back in early December for that national pro event that USYS held. You're at the Y World of Sports, 30 fields. You know, you park the car yep. in the morning. You're there all day. They got food ready for you. It's a, yeah. it's a very convenient thing. Uh, Crossroads out of Grand Park, I think, is a great one, too. Uh, again, mm -hmm. convenience factor. Now, do we go to the ones where you have to jump in the car and drive 20 minutes to another game? Yeah, you know, it's a necessary evil. But, um, yeah, I, the showcases are great. I just think they got to find a, way, you know, being respectful to everyone's budgets and whatever. We kind of yeah, have yeah. to pick and choose where we go and and how we go. Yeah. Yeah. So you said something I thought really interesting. You you think you compete more for Division One prospects than you do for Division Three? Like your competition, you look at more of the Division One programs than you do. Is there a reason for that, or is that just the way the landscape is? Is it because every kid says they want to play, you know, it's D1 or bust, or? Yeah, I it's actually, I really haven't thought about, like, thought about it that way. I think it kind of organically happens. I don't, I'm, I'm really particular on how I speak to recruits. I, I don't like to abuse the relationship, meaning I, I'm, mm -hmm. I want to get to know the kid and their family and build that relationship. But I think there's a, a, a fine line on uh, being respectful to them and not in, over influencing them on their decision. For example, I always tell people like I'm not going to ask you what you ate for lunch and what you're going to watch on Netflix tonight. You know, like I want to get to know you, but like that's not my business. You know, I'm trying to. That's 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 too much. That's too, too much, much knowing you. <laughs> right. I think what happens is you know there's just so much accessibility through texting, FaceTime, Zooms that um, yeah. you kind of over recruit and kids are feeling the love. I'll put in air quotations here because they think that coach, I'm trying to be politically correct here. Uh, really don't. Wants, yeah, which, <laughs> which I'm sure they do, but I think there's some ethics involved, right? You know, uh, yeah. Right? So for me, you know, that's a good point. I never badmouth recruit. I, I don't talk about other schools. Um, the point being is when we get to the part of the conversation where a kid tells me the schools they're talking to, I normally don't ask. They normally just tell me or the times I will ask is when we're getting to the end and he's like, coach, I got three schools I'm down to. And now it's April, whatever. And they got to make a decision. Then I'll ask and um, try to help navigate them through that decision, giving the pros mm -hmm. and cons to all. Include, and there's there's cons of John Carroll, too. It's not for everybody. I, I completely understand mm -hmm. it. So I, I think that's where I start learning of, like, well, he's talking to these two Division One programs and, and John Carroll. And that's that's kind of – and, again, I, I think I've stumbled upon that. It's not something I went and looked for. But I think once the conversation gets to that part and I'm very – respectful and mindful of the questions I'm asking them and it pops out, I do feel like there's usually at least one division one school in that conversation for guys that mm -hmm. we're going at. Um, <clears throat> Josh Lowe um, from Roanoke, we were talking and he calls it D1 or bust. He's like, every kid that is on the circuit looking to play thinks it's division one or nothing. And, and, and he didn't say it, but and it got me thinking. There is a little bit about schools, just especially D one with the resources. Like they're just pulling in all these kids. Like they're just trying to attract these kids, um, whether they're going to play or not is a different story. Whether or not they're, 
you know, are they going to be number 35 on the roster? Like, it's a different story, right? They just think that they're being recruited by Division One, and, and I And I think COVID sort of flushed this out a little bit, but I, I think it explains why you see the transfer portal so big now is because kids are like, I didn't sign up for this. This isn't what the story you told me when you were recruiting me, right? It, it, that's something I'm... I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty passionate about. I the D one or bus mentality makes no sense to me unless you truly think you're going to be a professional athlete. Yeah. You know, you go to school because you're trying to be in a situation that's academically fitting to you, whatever mm-hmm. that is, and putting athletics at the forefront of an academic decision for me is a recipe for disaster. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I've never understood why these very good players are okay with lowering their academic expectations yeah. just so that they say they play at the Division One level. I played D one. Yeah. There are some fantastic Division One at academic uh, programs in this country. No problem. I, I, I get yeah. that. Um, but to make a sacrifice on that and just to be able to put that in your Instagram or Twitter post always kind of makes me like giggle. That's that's exactly what he said. Yeah. He's um, like, you do it just so you could put it on Instagram, and then what? You're miserable. <laughs> like he was, he's a great guy. So like pretty straightforward, you know. I tell people all the time, when you look at someone who commits to a D1 school or D1 school, if you look at the wording of their post. It's always I've committed to play Division One soccer. At yeah. Division. Well, we yeah. all schools Division One. You, you, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not trying to. Uh, no, you know. no, I get it. I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I tell my, I tell my kids, um, my, my middle son and my oldest who went through the recruiting process. I was kind of like. Division one, division one. I totally get it. Totally understand. I was like, but let's be clear. Unless it's, and I could name the schools, you know. I'm like, unless it's one of those. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not too sure. Division one's your cup of tea. Right. I was like, I'd rather you strive for something better. Right. And, and again, there are hundreds of great players that are for sure Division one athletes who yeah, yeah. have a, a chance to play in the MLS or the next level, and I get it because. That's gonna be your your best route to That's get. That's it. Yeah. You know, I, I'll I do some mentoring at my church, uh, and there's one young lady in, in particular that I'm talking to now and trying to help her through her recruiting process. And she named a couple schools that she was interested in, and I said, hey, you know, did you look at this school's record the last couple of years? And she's like, no, I, I didn't. I'm like, well. Again, I'm making this up, but it was like one in fifteen and two and thirteen. Yeah. And, whatever, and I said, yeah. uh, "Are you okay if you go there and your record's two and fifteen again?" And she's like, "Well, no, I I want to win." I'm like, "Well, you think yeah. like how do you think that's gonna work if their records kind of not been so good the last couple of years? So are are you gonna be happy in that environment if it goes that way? Are you gonna be happy in that environment yeah. if?" you are on the team but not playing and the record's bad or if you are playing and the yeah. record's like there's and again i'm not trying to be doom and gloom but you, you got to be realistic with the situation you're putting yeah. yourself in. yeah 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 totally totally agree i mean we could just talk about this for the next hour like i, I mean there's so it's it is it is a little bit of a i hate to say it, it's a little bit of a trap right like for 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 kids and, and it's unfortunate and i I keep my mouth shut when people say, oh, he's being recruited by, I'm like, recruited or recruited? Like, there's a big difference, right? I know t- I know coaches who've gone out and recruited 30 guys, and they only care about two of them. Like, that's the reality of it. And, and I feel bad for the, the guys who do it the right way, and they kind of get the yeah. name from it. Uh, I mean, some of my very good friends, I mean, again, I'll, I'll, PJ Colba, and one of them, Michigan State, he is as transparent, as straightforward as they get. He tells these guys flat out, you know, there's there's no gray area. It's black and white, you know. And yeah. I appreciate that about TJ, and he's someone that I look up to, and he's taught me a lot. But um, being transparent and honest throughout the recruiting process is extremely yeah. important because you, you want to help that kid find the right situation because it's not about you. It's about them. 
and they need yeah, to yeah. Where, where they can be successful first and foremost in the classroom and then obviously on the field as a secondary thing and an extracurricular. Yeah. Hey, last question. And then, like I said, you could go take a nap or maybe not. Maybe if you have a screaming baby, not, not, <laughs> this might not happen. Um, do you, what, what, do you have any thoughts on high school soccer? Do you like it? Do you, I, I get that it's probably, you can't watch it much. I know. I mean, you might be in, in where you are in Ohio, be able to see some of the schools, but, um, I mean, are you a fan, not a fan? I'm a fan of it as a fan. I'm probably not a fan of it as a college coach, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So let me clarify. Like, if if I got to time travel back to when I played and the academy or MLS next or something would have been around, I would I would have been one of those guys. I probably would have not played high school soccer. I would have, I would have tried mm. to play that level um, probably until I hit that burnout phase and didn't want to play anymore. Yeah. You get my point. Like, that, that – yeah. And we were a good high school team and successful and won some stuff and it was fun. But for me, it was, you know, being in that environment would have been what I prefer. Now, what I really love about high school soccer is the camaraderie, the brotherhood, kind of it's like a, a different version of college soccer where you get to play in front mm -hmm. of your 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 your, t your schoolmates and teachers and professors and things of that mm -hmm. nature, which I think offers a, a whole different level of evaluation. So from a soccer evaluation part, I don't know if I value it as, as much, uh, but from a leadership and um, kind of just judging the kind of person they are, I think there's a lot of evaluation that you can see or you can do mm -hmm. when you're recruiting players, how they handle their teammates who they're, they're obviously probably a lot better than and helping them through tough times and uh, explaining the game to them and teaching them how to win and, and things like that. So it's not like I go to a, a high school game and I'm like, I want to see if this kid's good or not. If I'm going to the high school game, I probably already know he's pretty good. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have gone. Uh, but watching them kind of handle themselves uh, and how they, yeah. uh, again, lead that team is is important to me. Now, don't get me wrong. St. Ignatius is down the road, and, and Mike McLaughlin is one of the best coaches in the country. Oh, yeah. I get to go watch those guys play, and they look like a college team. So that's a whole different scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, I was fortunate enough to work their camp last summer with uh, Sinisha Ubipadapovic from Cleveland State, and, you know, him and mm -hmm. I look at each other, it's like, man, this is like a, like a college team. Yeah. They're, they're very good. Yeah. So, um, there are exceptions to the rules, and I think Ignatius is one of them. But, um, yeah, overall, I, I think there's value there. I just think that the evaluation process from my end is just a little bit different versus player and then leadership and, and things of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coach, this was fantastic. Even though, like I said, I got some resentment working through here, but I really do appreciate you taking the time. Um, I will be watching you. Like I was, I'm really impressed. Um, as again, I, I'm sure when when some of my fellow Raiders see this and how complimentary I was of you, like I'm gonna be in trouble. But you know what? I'll deal with that. I got that. Um, but hey, thank you very much. Really do, really do appreciate you taking the time today. No, of course, uh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. And I'll, I'll, I'll end this with a, a Raider compliment too. David Krems is one of my, my good buddies. Uh, I, I got nothing but great things to say about him. I think he's doing a really good job with the program. I think uh, he's the right man for the job, and he's definitely got those guys on the right path. So I, I reached out to him, and I think he's pretty busy these days. So, so we're gonna. We're, he's on the docket. It's just a matter of when, when he's going to be able to do that. So, um, looking, looking, we'll see how yeah, goes. yeah. I actually might stop by there, um, this in a couple days. I have to drive out West. So, um, <clears throat> anyhow, thank you very much. Do appreciate it. And I will be kind of cheering sort of on the sidelines for you guys, uh, from a distance. <laughs>